Hello, I'm Milton Riegelman. You'll forgive my hair. My barber has took a sabbatical. A sabbatical is supposed to be Saturday, one out of seven days, but uh, he's on sabbatical for a long time, I'm afraid. The title of this mini lecture is The COVID-19 Solution, colon, Ishmael. And it's not really uh, a lecture so much as an outline for a lecture, <clears throat> as you'll soon see. I should first uh, admit I'm going to commit several writing errors. Some of you will remember these because I splashed them in the margins in red ink on your papers. Uh, for instance, hasty generalization. Uh, this is a hasty generalization. If, I, if my cousin said that she bought a kumquat a couple of weeks ago and I was at Kroger and I saw people buying kumquats and I said the whole world is enamored with kumquats, that would be a hasty generalization. Post hoc, I'm certainly going to commit, post hoc fallacy is if B follows A, there is no necessary causal connection. That is, A hasn't caused B. For instance, uh, <clears throat> aha, uh, last week I ate a kumquat and the grade on my organic chemistry test with Joe Workman was 100. Well, the kumquat probably didn't cause that. Or another example, uh, someone says, uh, uh, me and John want to go outside. Okay, that's an outrageous grammatical error because uh, the subject is in the nominative case, not me, but I, and it's impolite to put yourself first. And so John and I want to go outside, not me and John. But if I said, aha, that's what caused the coronavirus, that would be an overstatement, probably, although we're not sure. Okay, I have two parts to this mini lecture. And the first part is pandemics or great tragedies often spur great literature, great art or literature in my case. The second part is that great art is the solution to pandemics, specifically Ishmael and Melville's Moby Dick. First part, pandemics spur great literature. In 1348 was the world's first well-established pandemic, the Black Plague or the, or the Black Death because it probably originated on the Black Sea. Uh, 40 to 68 percent of the population of Europe was wiped out uh, by the Black Plague. <coughs> it ravished every place. In Florence, where they kept better records as well as having better painters, we know that 50 percent of the population uh, died because of the plague. Luckily, not one Giovanni Boccaccio, who uh, wrote the Decameron during the Black Plague. The Decameron is a is a, is a 100 stories or tales told by seven women and three men who self-isolate in a villa outside the Florence gates uh, and over 10 days each tells 10 stories. Now are these despairing, morose, horrible, depressing stories? No, not at all. Uh, they're resilient, they're filled with joy and love, they're affirming of life and all of its manifestations. At the same time, 750 miles to the northwest, there's a young man named Geoffrey Chaucer who suffers the Black Plague as a, as a boy and then later iterations of it as an adult. Those of you who studied the Canterbury Tales with Paul Cantrell or Mark Rasmussen or others know how lively and fun and full of life and affirmation the Canterbury Tales are. Is this a post hoc? 
did the uh, pandemic of 1348 cause this literature? We're not sure, but what we can say is both of these incredible world masterpieces uh, were created in the shadow of the pandemic. And let me continue the point in a couple other ways quickly. In the 20th century, by, uh, by most critics' observation, uh, the greatest novelist, the greatest poet, the greatest playwright were all Irish. During the 20th century, Ireland composed about 3% of the world's English speakers. Why is it then that these, these towering uh, authors were all Irish? Well, Ireland had suffered a, the Great Famine and then a uh, <coughs> subjugation by a foreign power for 350 years and then a, a revolution and then a civil war, not even to mention World War I and II. Uh, did all of those things cause the greatest novelist, poet, and playwright to come from Ireland? Post hoc. Nevertheless, it is, it is interesting that all three happen to be Irish. I'm talking, of course, of James Joyce. Some of you studied Ulysses and Roberta White's incomparable senior and junior seminar. Uh, for the poet, I'm talking about William Butler Yeats, who has a center connection, by the way, since for about 16 years in the 20th century, when he was in London, as he often was, he lived across the street from Ensley Court, where many center students lived and studied. The greatest playwright? Uh, the authorities talk about Samuel Beckett. Others say, no, it wasn't Beckett, it was George Bernard Shaw. It doesn't matter, they're both Irish. To continue this point, why is it that Mississippi, that suffered through tragedy in the long aftermath of slavery and the Civil War, produced more fine writers than, say, Indiana? Who would put Lou Wallace, Booth Tarkington, Theodore Dreiser, and Ida Mae Davis up against William Faulkner, Eudora Welty, Richard Wright, and Walker Percy? Not Mark Lucas, and certainly not me. Think about the flowering of American Jewish writers after World War II and the Holocaust. Uh, and there's a whole string of them, a couple of Nobel Prize winners, Saul Bellow and Isaac uh, <coughs> Bashevik Singer, Singer, Joseph Heller, Bernard Malamud, E.L. Doctorow, Nathaniel West, J.D. Sollinger, Philip Roth, and so forth. Did World War II and the Holocaust cause those Jewish writers to have this explosion of talent? Well, not necessarily, but the evidence seems uh, pretty strong to me. To be sure, there are some uh, results of pandemics in art that are despairing, uh, even nihilistic. One thinks here of, for instance, uh, Hemingway's overrated For Whom the Bell Tolls. Uh, but by and large, pandemics like, produce, like the Decameron and the Canterbury Tales, incredible works of affirmation and positive wonder about human life. Part two, Ishmael as the solution to COVID-19. This past center term, uh, there was a freshman uh, first year studies class, a seminar taught with the title, Unlocking the American Identity, Moby Dick. And now I'd like uh, Mackenzie to show some slides as I describe them. And the first slide is of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is of the class in a little uh, exercise in the Hazelrig gym. We couldn't go out on Lake Harrington uh, because it was, uh, it was raining that day. And who you see here from the left to the right is Julia Long, uh, Madison Payton sitting down, 
uh, Trenton Duper to her uh, right. Behind them is Jonathan Nelson, who, by the way, is playing Starbuck, the first mate. Uh, standing up is Connor Roberts, who's playing Tashtego, the harpooner. Uh, to his right is Alexis Skiles. Uh, and then over to the far right is Masaki Matthews and Ivy Irahami. Uh, in the second uh, slide, uh, you will see, uh, is, uh, is Connor Teshtego throwing the harpoon. Moby Dick has been spotted. There she blows. Uh, I must say he threw it pretty ineptly, even though he'd won the harpooning contest, uh, because he missed the male that was about, uh, the whale that was about 30 yards away by about 20 yards. And in the third slide, uh, Moby Dick, the, the, <laughs> the pathetic little blow-up whale that you see there on the floor, pulled by a secret assistant, an accomplice, has attacked the boat. Uh, Madison is, uh, is laughing. Uh, she's about to die, as all of them are, although Elliot Dickinson, to her left, knows the tragedy that's about to take place. <clears throat> this is the plot of Moby Dick. Thirty men are sequestered or self-isolated on the Pequod, the whaleboat, led by a narcissistic captain following his own self-serving agenda rather than thinking of his men. Do they all die a peaceful, natural death surrounded by friends and family uh, moving, passing away to the church triumphant? No. They're all sucked mercilessly down in a vortex of death. Starbucks, uh, <coughs> Starbucks boat is the last uh, to go, and we saw the uh, we saw the harpoon with actually a stick with a rubber ball in it. We didn't want to kill anybody uh, being thrown at Moby Dick. Let me say one other thing before we get into uh, six points. Uh, I distinguish between Ishmael, who is an, an actor on the Pequod, he's part of the story of Moby Dick, I call him Ishmael I. The narrator of the book, who narrates it probably 20 years later or so, I call Ishmael II. This is a useful distinction that I first uh, came across uh, by the, the great Melville critic Edgar Dryden. Ishmael I is aboard the whaleboat. Ishmael II is telling the story some years later. I'm going to make six points about Ishmael II as the solution. Uh, Mackenzie, if you show that slide, uh, <clears throat> six points. And you can see, we'll go through them one by one. The first point, Ishmael is a stoical, is stoical, accepting, and resilient. He tells us in the first chapter, Loomings, uh, it's, he's grim about the mouth, it's a damp, drizzly November in his soul, he knows he's going to be uh, sequestered with uh, about 24 other men in the forecastle, which is a tiny little place, they'll be passing all kind of germs uh, among them. And yet, look how he writes about it, it's a terrible situation, look how he writes about it. Uh, <clears throat> Let's read it together. This comes near the end of that first chapter. What of it? If some old hunks of a sea captain orders me to get a broom and sweep the decks, what does that indignity amounted, amount to? Weighed, I mean, in the scales of the New Testament. Do you think the archangel Gabriel thinks anything the less of me because I promptly and respectfully obey that old hunks in that particular instance? Who ain't a slave? Tell me that. Well then, however the old sea captains may order me about, however they may thump and punch me about, I have the satisfaction of knowing that it's all right. 
that everybody else is one way or other served in much the same way, either in a physical or metaphysical point of view, that is. And so the universal thump is passed around and all hands should rub each other's shoulder blades and be content. <clears throat> John Ralph has a, a mantra, uh, be your best, do your best, no regrets. And John Ralph is a stoic, no regrets. Don't spend your life moaning and second guessing things that have happened. Uh, get on with it, <clears throat> get on with it, and Ishmael does. He is a Ralphian stoic. Uh, he's accepting and he's resilient, as one certainly needs to be in times of pandemics. Point number two, if you'd show the chart again, uh, user-friendly, self-effacing. Aren't you a little tired, students, of reading about writers who are so uh, almost obsessed with themselves uh, sort of like uh, painters. Do you know that uh, Rembrandt painted 80 self-portraits? Van Gogh painted 40 of himself? No. Ishmael is not, does not paint himself. Ishmael's canvas is the world and all of its glorious manifestations. Uh, the world as history, as myth, as religion, as politics, as sociology, all those ologies, biology and psychology and anthropology and the rest of the ologies. <clears throat> He's self-effacing. We don't know anything about him very much. At the end, I'll tell you just a couple of hints we have. Uh, but he's a blank canvas. The world is his canvas. He's user-friendly. We get to like him and because he knows who we are and he continually makes jokes that only we get. We're special when we read uh, from Ishmael too. Number three, if you show the, show the uh, chart again, McKinsey. He's open, open and accepting. <clears throat> Now, Ishmael II, in 1851, knows more about whales than Albert Einstein, Bill Gates, and Google would today. He knows more about whales than any other human being perhaps has ever known about any single subject, and he marshals all of it in his books, uh, particularly in the whaling chapters, when he sort of parks the narrative and, and zooms in on, say, the skull of the whale, or the brain of the whale, or the skin of the whale, or the skeleton of the whale. I want to show you a couple of uh, passages. The first from 79, <clears throat> which is called The Prairie. Ishmael writes, <clears throat> Champollion deciphered the wrinkled granite hieroglyphics by the way, he did crack the uh, Rosetta Stone. He didn't crack it literally because you can still see it in the British Museum, but he cracked the code. But there's no Champollion to decipher the Egypt of every man's and every being's say, face. Physiognomy, and that was a, a, a well-reputed science at the time. <clears throat> Physiognomy, like every other human science, is but a passing fable. Every other human science is but a passing fable. <clears throat> if then Sir William Jones, the great linguist, who read in 30 languages, could not read the simplest peasant's face in its profounder and more subtle meanings, how may unlettered Ishmael hope to read the awful Chaldee of the sperm whale's brow? I but put that brow before you. Read it if you can. I but put that brow before you. Read it if you can. And from chapter 68, the tale. The more I consider this mighty tale, the more do I deplore my inability to express it. Dissect him how I may then, I go but skin deep. I know him not and never will. I know him not and never will. Ishmael never is, is uh, rigid in his beliefs. He knows that physiognomy, like phrenology and every other human science, to include all the ones we have some belief in, are but passing fables. Be open to new things, to new 
ways to organize our universe. Number four, chart again, please, McKinsey. Number four, connect it to others. <clears throat> we uh, did a little experiment in the first year seminar. If you would show that slide, McKinsey. Uh, on the slide is uh, Rodin's famous uh, public sculpture of the Burgers of Calais that he uh, he made in 1889. <clears throat> he made 12 castings of this, so you see it at different spots. Uh, the burgers of Calais are the six burgers, including the mayor of the town, who during the Hundred Years' War, after their uh, city was surrounded and starved, who uh, draped uh, ropes around their neck and went out uh, to uh, offer themselves up uh, if, if the Brits would save the town, they would accept death. So it was a wonderful self-serving act, and Calais, by the way, commissioned uh, Rodin uh, to sculpt this. We, uh, we tried to emulate that in class, and you see the, the six burgers of uh, the freshman uh, seminar there with ropes, uh, because we wanted to understand better chapter 60, the line, if you would show that, uh, McKinsey. The line is, is the, the rope or the whale boat that is attached uh, to the harpoon and, uh, and the whale, and then it pulls the boat along as the whale swims. <clears throat> At the end, Ishmael too writes, all men live enveloped in whale lines. All men live enveloped in whale lines. All of us are born with halters round our necks. But it is only when caught in the swift, sudden turn of death that mortals realize the silent, subtle, ever-present perils of life. And if you be a philosopher, though seated in the whale boat, you would not at heart feel one whit more terror than those seated before your evening fire with a poker and not a harpoon by your side. Uh, at five o'clock every uh, afternoon, Kentucky Governor Andy Bashir uh, has a press conference and his voice and his manner and his learning are so satisfying and comforting that uh, uh, people rush back to, to to be with Andy at five o'clock. And he ends, or he begins those conferences in the same way. He says, and then he has the audience repeat, we will get this, we will get through this, we will get through this together. Ishmael too knows that we will get through this together. All men live connected to whale lines. All men live enveloped in whale lines in this pandemic. Number five, please, the chart, strong personal core. Uh, Ishmael too is connected to others always, but he has a deep personal core that is unassailable by others in the outside. Uh, he calls this an insular Tahiti. Uh, if you'd show the, the, uh, the excerpt from chapter 58 and 68, McKinsey. Uh, 58 is called Brit. It's the stuff that the whales eat. And uh, Ishmael too uh, distinguishes between the land and the sea in many, many, many ways. Uh, the land is often safe, the sea is often unsafe. And at the end of this, he says, consider all this, and then turn to this green, gentle, and most docile earth. Consider them both, the sea and the land. Do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? Ishmael too is always finding analogies. For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies, there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all the horrors of the half-known life, the pandemic. God keep thee, push not off from that isle, 
thou canst never return. In the soul of man lies one insular Tahiti full of peace and joy. In chapter 60, one of the grand ones, the grand armada, which is when uh, the Pequod uh, moves from the Indian Ocean into the Pacific where it will meet the Moby Dick, uh, they come across this armada of whales, uh, young buck males circling in a, in a grand, like, like circus horses, a circle. But in the center of the circle are female whales and other. Uh, we see whales, as you will see in the, in the text, and I'll read chapter 60. And thus, surrounded by circle upon circle of consternations and affrights, did these inscrutable creatures at the center, see how he spells it correctly, by the way, the center freely and fearlessly indulge in all peaceful concernments, yea, serenely reveled in dalliance and delight. But even so, amid the tornadoed Atlantic of my being, do I myself still forever centrally disport in mute calm. And while ponderous planets of unwaning woe revolve round me, listen to the alliteration that he uses when things get really intense, deep down and deep inland, there I still bathe me in eternal mildness of joy. Amid the tornad tornadoed Atlantic of my being, do I myself still forever centrally disport and mute calm in this insular Tahiti that he has to resist the pandemic during and afterwards. Finally, number six, if you once again show the, uh, the outline on the board, he's a storyteller. <clears throat> we don't know much about Ishmael II, how he got to be Ishmael II. We know there's about 20 years between Ishmael I and Ishmael II. Uh, but you said, you might say, aha, you said that the 30 went down to their death in a watery vortex. But I lied. Because one survives, and that's one Ishmael. Uh, he's on the outskirts of the vortex, and he's pulled down about to die, and suddenly up shoots the life buoy of his friend, uh, Queequeg, and he hops on that and, and uh, drifts about the Pacific two days until he's picked up by oh, another whale ship, the Rachel. Okay. Do we know what allowed him to be so resilient and to survive with, with some grandeur, this pandemic, this Ahabian pandemic? He never tells us because he's self-effacing. He's not egotistical, but Melville does allow a couple of hints. And the first hint comes in the middle of the book when, like the Welling chapters, uh, Ishmael II simply parks the narrative and tells uh, a, another story. It's the longest chapter of the 135 in the novel. It's called The Town Hose Story. And the story is about a whale boat and so forth, and so it has some parallels to the main plot, the main story, but those parallels aren't enough to justify it, and he wasn't trying to pad out the novel because it's already pretty long. And let me read what he says there from uh, the town hose story. <clears throat> he, doesn't, he doesn't simply tell it to us, but he tells it to us like he once told it before, and he, and he writes, For my humor's sake, let me preserve the style in which I once narrated at Lima to a lounging circle of my Spanish friends, one saint's eve, smoking upon the thick gilt tiled piazza of the Golden Inn. Of those fine cavaliers, the young dons, Pedro and Sebastian, were on closer terms with me. And hence, the questions they occasionally put during my telling, which are duly answered at this time. Now, why would he have done this unless 
Melville wanted to indicate something important about him, that he's telling a story, uh, drinking the local coffee and the local beer. He said, your cheek is very fine, he tells the young Dons during the story. He wanted to indicate something about how Ishmael has lived his life since uh, the Pequod disaster. There's another hint, and it comes uh, later in uh, a chapter called The Bower in the Arsicides, when once again, and I'll read, he's, uh, he, he's telling stories. Uh, this is from chapter 102. Uh, as for my exact knowledge of the bones, this is on the skeleton, the bones of the Leviathan and their gigantic full-grown development, for that rare knowledge, I am indebted to my late royal friend Tranquo, king of Tranque, one of the Arsicides. Uh, and they've retired to his palm villa at Pupella. Well, it's a series of linguistic jokes that Melville, Ishmael too, loves. Tranque and Tranquo. Tranquo uh, are from the Latin word tranquil or at ease. Once again, he's, he's telling stories, he's at ease uh, to friends. He is like one of the most famous images from the book, and let me read it, of the Catskill Eagle. The Catskill Eagle comes at the end of the Triworks, a particularly dramatic uh, chapter, uh, <clears throat> and I read. Uh, he talks about the world as vanity from Ecclesiastes, all as vanity. <clears throat> and then he ends the chapter in this way. Give not thyself up then to fire. Ishmael has stared into the Triworks fire and become discombobulated and turned around, almost sinks the ship, in fact. Do not do this, lest it invert thee, deaden thee, as for the time it did me. There is a wisdom that is woe, the wisdom of staring into the fire, but there is a woe that is madness. And there is a Catskill eagle in some souls that can alike dive down into the blackest gorges and soar out of them again and become invisible in the sunny spaces. And even if the Catskill Eagle forever flies within the gorge, that gorge is in the mountains, so that even in his lowest swoop, the mountain eagle is still higher than the other birds upon the plain, even though they soar. Ishmael is the Catskill Eagle. In short, Ishmael, in post pequod days, is curious. He's open to new ideas. His mind is nuanced and, and flexible. He studies abroad like 85% of recent center students have done. Uh, he's curious. And he spends a lot of time talking to friends, telling stories, art, literature. So once you're able to go outside and take off your masks, find a few close friend, friends, sit on a gilt-edged piazza, ordering coffee and the local beer, and telling stories. Thank you. Can you explain what's on the mantle? Oh, sure. Uh, I have a Melville friend who's a Melville scholar who uh, taught in Kentucky in the Governor's Scholars Program and then taught in Seattle and uh, now lives in Denver or nearby Denver, Idaho Springs. And he has a little business and the business is making things having to do with Melville and he sells them in a little shop. But he sends me things. Uh, and he was here, he was the secret accomplice pulling the fake Moby Dick uh, by a nylon string in the Hazel Rig Gym experiment. Uh, and he, sent, he brought this when he, this is a rather lovely uh, rendering of Moby Dick who is breaching, I think, uh, about to attack one of the whaleboats. <clears throat> it's made of driftwood. Uh, this is a book 
he didn't write this. This was written by a, a, a young, untrained librarian who became obsessed with Moby Dick, as one can do. In fact, two uh, Sinner alums have written me recently that in their sequestration, they started reading it and they were obsessed. Good work. Uh, this guy, every, for every page of the 530-page novel, he put together a, 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 a kind of a pastiche uh, and it's fabulous. He, he's, he's, this book has sold really well, and he's, now he's working on another book for other Melville works. It's called Moby Dick in Pictures. Uh, call me Ishmael. This is a pretty good likeness of uh, He Burns Wood. My friend Hank Gelmish is his name. Uh, he says, call me Ishmael. Of course, that's Melville, and that's all of us now. Uh, this is sort of cut glass. He does cut glass as well as wood and other things. Uh, and finally, uh, we went over to Maker's Mark when he was here, and he uh, he pointed, he discovered, and I'd seen but forgotten, a an advertisement for Maker's Mark, uh, and Moby Dick becomes a bottle of Maker's Mark. Uh, and uh, I think you have a slide of this if you'd show that. Let's leave people with Maker's Mark because you might want to serve that along with coffee to your friends on the Gilt Edge Piazza as you tell coronavirus stories. Thank you.